Um, so I'm Jerry Condon. I'm a member of the coordinating committee of our Veterans for Peace Nuclear Abolition Working Group. For those of you who are new to us, uh, this uh, working group has been kind of reactivated about a year ago. And we've actually been meeting uh, bi-weekly, which is every two weeks um, for the last year. And uh, we've on the first meeting of the month, which is now on the second Friday, um, which is today, we, uh, we typically have a guest speaker. And uh, we have a wonderful guest speaker today, uh, physicist uh, Theodore Ted Postel. He's a professor emeritus at MIT and former, believe it or not, former senior advisor to the Chief of Naval Operations on Nuclear Weapons Issues and Policy. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Ted has uh, courageously stood up to the U.S. government and the mainstream media on several occasions, challenging false reporting on the wars in Iraq and Syria. And uh, in a, I heard him in a recent webinar with Ray McGovern and John Mearsheimer. And by the way, Ted, uh, uh, Ray was our, our guest speaker last month. Um, and uh, Ted was expressing uh, grave concern that if the war in Ukraine escalates further, it could become a nuclear war. So that's what he's going to be sharing with us today uh, in more detail. So uh, if you want to say anything more about uh, self-introduction, Ted, uh, please feel free. And thank you so much for joining us. Well, first of all, thank you very much. I, I would just like to thank you all uh, for your service to the country. Um, what I'm going to do is first I'm going to uh, share some slides with you. Um, what, what I'm going to try to talk about today is what I consider to be the grave danger of accidental nuclear war that we're now uh, facing. Um, the important point to keep in mind is that there are an uncountable and infinite number of possibilities that could lead to an action and reaction cycle that could lead to escalation and uh, a nuclear exchange that would destroy civilization as we know it. So when I give you some examples here, it is very important for you to understand that these are just picked out from some you know, guesses or some experiences I know we have had, but this does not mean that this is in any way it's pointing uh, to the uh, real potential here. The potential can be from anywhere. One of the points I'd like to make immediately, though, is that uh, it's extremely important that everybody who thinks about this subject, who's interested, understand that if something happens at a very low level, this it does not mean that everybody has the information they need to make competent decisions. Let me give you just some real, some simple examples that I hope will make the point. Uh, when the World Trade Center was attacked in, on September 11th, um, no one knew what was happening. Not the president, not the chiefs of staff, not the air traffic control system. Nobody had any idea what was happening. Now I'd like to point out, although it was a horrific uh, attack in terms of its consequences, it was nothing close to what might have occurred if a single nuclear weapon went off somewhere in the country. And even in the conditions where uh, this attack occurred in, basically in downtown New York, none of the communication systems were dead, were destroyed. Uh, none of the uh, uh, systems that we typically use were overloaded. Television was operating. Uh, we had a complete mis we had no understanding of what was happening. I was in Washington preparing to give a talk that evening. I remember watching this literally in real time as it happened. And we grounded all of the aircraft over the United States because we didn't know if there were a hundred aircraft that were involved that would be involved in the attack or two or none. We, we had no idea what was happening for many, many hours. And uh, in fact, in the days and weeks afterward, we know that in the White House, there were great fears that Osama bin Laden had a nuclear weapon and that he might actually use it. Of course, these fears were 
based on uh, no knowledge at all. But that's important that they thought that because here is a guy whose technology really was to run, you know, get fanatics to run a plane into the into, into the uh, trade center, uh, trade centers, uh, and to uh, uh, to poison goats in a tent with cyanide. And we were worried that this guy had a nuclear weapon and was going to attack us. The point is not that it's silly. The point is that you really have no idea what is happening when something big happens. And I, I emphasize this because there is this underlying misunderstanding that people have about some of these incidents that I'll talk about, or about potential incidents that I'm talking about, that people somehow have you know, total situational awareness. In fact, they have no situational awareness. Things are happening too fast. There are too many relevant and irrelevant pieces of information, even if they're accessible. And it, 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 that is where the great danger comes from, the complete lack of understanding of what is evolving around you when you're in a position where you believe, right or wrong, you have to make a decision. So um, th this is extremely important to keep in mind. Um, what I, what I want to do from the beginning here is to give you some sense of how serious the consequences of a rapid escalation could be. I don't want to dwell on this, but I, I want to go through this in enough detail that people have, have begin to have a sense of what we're talking about. Um, what I'm showing you here is an image of the Pentagon. Probably everyone here knows it. And the inner circle here uh, shows the, the accuracy of a Trident II uh, nuclear ballistic missile. Now, the reason this is relevant is because the Trident II is the most accurate nuclear weapon in the American arsenal that's delivered by ballistic missile. Trident operates at sea, the large ocean areas where it, it hides, and it has this killing power that is far greater than the killing power of any of our or Russia's ICBMs. Now, the fact that this missile is so potentially dangerous from the Russian point of view is that it has the combination of accuracy and yield to use only a small number of Trident warheads to essentially destroy the entire land-based retaliatory forces of Russia, ICBM forces. So this poses a major, major threat from the point of view of, uh, shall we call it, nuclear warfighting. Now, nuclear warfighting is an oxymoron. Anyone who gets into a nuclear war is gonna be dead along with their, anyone else they fight. But the fact of the matter is that the United States could never have developed a system with this kind of accuracy if we weren't at some level thinking about we might, might, maybe fighting a nuclear war. The Russians have not missed this. This is a big item on, on the screen of, a, of a military planners in Russia, and they are very concerned about the, about the potential for the Trident for a Trident II attack uh, against Russian uh, strategic nuclear forces. Now, this uh, picture here is uh, a, a picture of Nagasaki prior to the atomic bombing in, in 1946. And um, uh, the, the distances here are small, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 feet. And this is what um, this area looked like uh, after the attack occurred. Now, I've labeled the, the circles um, with um, an unusual um, uh, label. In this circle here, if you were at this range, the fireball from the Nagasaki detonation would appear 20,000 times as bright as the desert sun at noon. So it would burn you to a crisp. You would be literally charcoal. Um, at 2,000 feet, it's 5,000 times um, higher. Um, and uh, 
um, at 3,000 feet, it's 2,000 times higher. And this emphasizes the fact that the most dangerous part of a nuclear weapon is the extraordinary temperature of the fireball, not the blast. Most people think, oh, the blast wave is terrible. It is. It's very destructive. But the real destructive feature of a nuclear weapon is you should think of it as like a little piece of the sun that has been brought down to the earth and allowed to radiate its energy for a few seconds or fractions of seconds of time. Since it's, since it's so hot and so much light and heat is radiating from it, it sets things on fires at great distances. This is what a real, uh, this is one of the real destructive concerns from a nuclear weapon. So if you think blast is the big issue, you're wrong. And in fact, the uh, Federal Emergency Management Administration was wrong about this for decades. And um, anyway, just to give you a feel for the scale of consequence for a single Russian nuclear warhead, one of maybe uh, 2,000, one of maybe uh, maybe 1,000 of, um, of land-based ICBMs, that we would be trying to destroy if we were attacked it first. Uh, this is what uh, a particular warhead, uh, an 800 kiloton warhead, about a little bit more than half of the warheads on their ICBMs are 800 kilotons or so. And this shows you roughly the altitude, it seems counterintuitive that it would be detonated at such a high altitude, it seems so high, over what's called the ground zero, the area that you want to do uh, highest damage to. Now, when the weapon is detonated, it creates a fireball. What happens is the nuclear weapon generates an enormous amount of energy in a very short period of time and in a very small volume of space. So you're talking about um, so much energy within a, a, a few cubic feet because the initial weapon is just releasing the energy that the internal energy inside the nuclear weapon reaches 100 million degrees Kelvin. That's about five times hotter than the center of the sun. Now what happens in about once, you're seeing this thing is about one second after the initial detonation. X-rays from the, from the super hot weapon immediately pour out into the surrounding air and they heat the surrounding air to fantastic temperatures maybe a few million degrees, so it's, it's, which is a lot of, I mean, it's not 100 million, but it's very high. And this very um, superheated air starts expanding out like a fast moving piston. And it, it, and it moves out against the surrounding air, ca ca causing the surrounding air to pile up into a shock wave of enormous extent. So that's initial, so this is, so around this fireball, you have a highly compressed shell of air at this point. Notice that I have intentionally obscured the ground. And this was an intentional um, uh, illustration on my part because below this fireball, the ground would be exploding. I mean, literally exploding from the light and heat from the fireball, which is so immense that concrete would literally uh, explode into dust because the heating would be so high that one part of the fireball would be, one part of the surface of the concrete would be so hot relative to the uh, part underneath that it would just shatter from, from explosive effects. So this would be, so the ground would be um, filled with this, these clouds of debris uh, evaporating asphalt from the streets, um, dust from, uh, from uh, rocks and, and, and concrete being just blown apart by the superheating. So the fireball has not yet, the, the shock wave has not yet hit the ground. So um, after a very long time for this yield of weapon, notice it's 30 or 40 seconds. The first one was at one second. So this is a long time. Nobody, of course, in this area would be aware of what's going on because everyone would be dead. But um, 
But basically, uh, within 30 or 40 seconds, you would see a tremendous amount of dust kicked up by the propagating shockwave. So there's, now the shockwave has left the fireball. It's, 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 it's propagating along. There's, there's a reflected shock on the ground. The, the primary shock combines with the reflected shock. And, and you have um, fantastic amounts of blast damage, which are almost irrelevant because the superheated air, the superheated light from the fireball has already destroyed everything that matters on the ground, that's reachable on the ground. So basically what happens afterwards, here's the initial fireball, it becomes a very hot region of air that buoyantly rises and in the process of buoyantly rising, it tends to flatten out because it's, it's rising into air that is basically not, not moving. So it, 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 the air that it's not moving causes friction at the edge. And you see this rotating effect. And you see these kinds of things. Um, you can see this kind of fireball when people ignite uh, a fuel air explosive or uh, you know uh, a dust explosion, where a large amount of a large volume of air gets gets you know mo movies are big on this. They like to show you this kind of explosion. But um, this is on a vast scale, many miles in uh, in, in length, and um, the winds, the after winds, because this thing is sucking air in it behind it, are 200, 300, 200, 300 miles per hour. Very very so at, at certain ranges from the detonation point, if you looked on the ground, uh, you would expect to see, let's say if there were uh, uh, poles, uh, light poles or something that had been blown out, you'd actually find them pointing in because the, the wind from the fireball rising afterwards would be so intense it would, it would suck enormous amounts of debris into the, into the area. So the single weapon, would create an area that looks roughly this size. Uh, so we're talking about several miles, uh, four or five miles in, uh, in, in, in radius, all on fire, uh, a, a, a zone of fantastic, um, uh, if, if any of you are aware of the details of what happened in the firestorms in uh, Germany and uh, Tokyo, in, uh, Japan, during World War II, uh, this would be a far more intense firestorm for reasons I won't discuss here, but the area, the physical size of the fire, uh, of the burning area increases the intensity of the firestorm. Think of it as a, as a fireplace that when it burns more violently or when the fire is bigger, the air that gets sucked in, the rate of air getting sucked in is higher. The, um, the, although the air is coming in at a higher rate, the temperature inside is even higher. And so the net result is if the zone is bigger, the in, internal um, uh, area is even more um, hot and, uh, and, and uh, destructive. So um, in Germany, uh, we, we have experience from this. Uh, people were literally incinerated on the streets. Okay, so... Uh, this is one nuclear weapon out of thousands. Uh, I'm not trying to say this is what would happen. I'm just trying to show you the potential consequences on a very small scale relative to the kinds of things that could be much larger. And if we talk about an uncontrolled escalation, would in fact be almost certainly much larger involving hundreds. And I think my, my own view, guess, it's a guess, is a, uh, thousands of nuclear weapons, essentially destroying uh, civilization as we know it. So, so that's what's at stake, what's at stake. And this is all due to people making decisions that start an action reaction cycle that nobody knows how to control because nobody has the information and understanding of the situation and the communications capability to stop what's going on. I can't say what it would be, Hopefully, uh, we'll never see it. If we ever see it, none of us are going to be around to, to study it, you know, because we won't, we won't know what happened. No one will know what happened because everything will have been destroyed. 
But uh, certainly one of the features that we can talk about, features of our warning system, is that Russia and the United States have both built warning systems against long range nuclear missile attack. And uh, the United States has done the best that can be done. It, it's not adequate. I'm not suggesting it's adequate, but it's the best that can be done. And the, the United States can see the launch of Russian ballistic missiles in Russia with satellites we have deep in space. These satellites are in what's called geosynchronous orbits. I'll show you what a geosynchronous orbit is later. But they can look down at the Earth and see the bright plume of the rockets while they're in powered flight. The rockets typically take three to five minutes of powered flight. And we would know almost at launch that these rockets were in flight because our systems are that good. And we would be sending out information to our military leadership that an attack is underway. Now, the president wouldn't necessarily know because the military leadership would have to look at the data and decide whether or not the data is real, you know, because false alarms do occur. And who knows how long they would take. Typically, people think five or six minutes or whatever, who knows. Then uh, we would have about 20 minutes. We could not see the warheads when they're drifting through space. We only see the rockets when their rocket motors are burning. We would then see, uh, we would then not see them for 20 minutes, but roughly 20 minutes after they're in free flight, so 25 minutes after their launch, they would start breaking the radar screen of our early warning radars. We have these giant early warning radars that can look out into space and see the warheads coming. Once those, uh, warheads are observed by the radar, it takes a few minutes to get enough tracking information to have an estimate of where they're gonna actually land. And the estimates are very rough, uh, but they tell us if it's, you know, if hundreds are coming toward the middle of the United States, to the coasts, everywhere, you know, so that we will have that information uh, nine to 15 minutes before their impact. And then uh, they would impact and most people who worry about nuclear war fighting, it may, this may assume that a very large number of these warheads would be aimed at the Minuteman ballistic missiles in the Midwest of the United States. The objective would be to try to destroy these missiles while they're still in their launch silos. Now, of course, that's a big that gamble because we would see them coming for 30 minutes and we can launch these rockets within minutes. We need a presidential decision, but um, you know, they could be launched rapidly. My own, if I were advising a president during one of these horrifying scenarios, if I were, and believe me, I won't, wouldn't be, it'd be some political person who's worried more about what the Republicans are gonna say than than, uh, than what's actually happening. And I, and I can back that up with data. Um, but it, if you have a really knowledgeable person there, what they would tell the president is, who cares about the ICBMs? If we need to retaliate, we have submarines that will destroy the Soviet Union or Russia in this case, many times over. We don't know this attack is real. There are all kinds of complicated communication systems involved. My advice to you, Mr. President or Ms. President, don't do anything because there will be no ambiguity if, they, if this is a real attack and there will be no problem retaliating. That would be my advice. But uh, I doubt a president would get that advice. Certainly when I was in the Pentagon, that was not the advice that was given the president. The president was told in briefings, I saw some of those briefings, how much time they had to launch the ICBMs. Even though we had bombers, and submarines that could end Russia, the Soviet Union at that time. Uh, and there was no need to launch on such a short timeline. But in any case, well, if you think this timeline is short, you want to see what the Russians are facing. The Russians are facing a more capable anti-ICBM threat 
than we are facing from Russian ICBMs because all right, our submarines at sea are more accurate with their, with their high yield warheads and thereby have much greater capability to destroy, to destroy Russian ICBMs in their missile silos. So let's look at some of the timelines. Here's a radar that's forward based. And if it's launched on a slightly depressed trajectory at long range from the North Atlantic from a Trident submarine, one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven minutes, seven or eight minutes. If it's a launch from a longer range, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine or 10 minutes. That is not enough time to make a decision. Here is what a decision-making timeline might look like. Remember, these are technologies. They don't work instantly. So in this case, we know the missiles are launched within one minute, probably less in, 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 for us, not for the Russians. They don't know the missile is launched until it breaks their radar horizon because their satellite systems cannot see the ocean areas from which Trident operates. So they don't know they're under attack until their radars tell them. And their radars are line of sight, as I'll show you. Take some time to characterize the, the, uh, what you're seeing, whether it's from satellites or not, in a minute. You need a military uh, conference to determine what's happening. It, what kind of response you can have. So you see, I've already used up five, four or five minutes. And that's a very generous number because then you're gonna decide how to, how to uh, respond. So, so you're talking six or eight minutes just, just to decide, know you're under attack and decide how to respond. So, um, so I would say um, if you have six or eight, eight or 10 minutes warning time, you don't have the time to make any kind of decision. So the only thing you can do if you're Russia is to have a system of pre-delegation of launch authority. You tell people in the field, if you lose communication with me, if you detect nuclear a nuclear detonation on Moscow or near Moscow, you are now free to launch your forces under your own control. You don't need leadership to say go ahead or not. This is in fact, this is in effect a doomsday machine. We have created a situation with Russia. And I'm saying we, because we could have corrected this. I've been working on this for 20 years and being laughed at for 20 years. Um, we could have corrected this. We have created a situation for Russia where they have had no choice but to build a doomsday machine. And um, Let's hope they, they never have to use it. So the timelines are ex extremely short. Um, so let me um, um, uh, go back to where I was. Uh, this, is just, this just shows you examples of what are called uh, orbits that are used by both the United States and Russia for satellites that are looking at the Earth uh, for warning of nuclear attack. The both Russia and the United States have tr have launched constellations of satellites in a what called geosynchronous orbit. A geosynchronous orbit is just simply an orbit that's high enough in altitude that it rotates around the Earth once in a day, once every 24 hours. So as the Earth rotates below, it, it appears to always be over the same location of the Earth. That's why geosynchronous is used for communication satellites and all kinds of things like that. The other kind of satellite orbit that's commonly used are satellite orbits that are called Molnia orbits or Molnaya orbits. It's a Russian name. These are orbits that take 12 hours. So they're called semi-synchronous orbits. And um, so every 24 hours, when you're up at the apogee, you're looking at the same location here. What we now know about Russia's satellite system is that they have not solved the problem of looking against the, black, the, the bright background of the Earth. Very hard to see things against re reflections from the sun against the background of the Earth. A, a missile plume is very bright, but it's a dim object you're seeing. You're, if you're looking into a square kilometer, 
of, of space on the ground, the reflected light is tremendous even relative to a missile plume. So you have to be able to distinguish that there's a missile plume against the background relative um, to, to the background. The Russians have not solved this problem. So they have nine, they, they used to have nine satellites in orbit. Each one would replace for about two and a half hours the one before it and looking down at the earth. So the idea would be they look for the missile against the, the black background of space. So now when they try to do this from geosynchronous orbit, what they have is a satellite system that this is the system we discovered. And incidentally, our intelligence community was not aware of this. This was a discovery made at MIT analyzing publicly available data. When I went to the Pentagon with this, I went to both the Russians. I went to both the Russians and the Americans. I want to be clear about this. I went to Russia to give it to, I, was not, I wasn't sure I was going to be arrested because this has got to have been one of the big secrets that Russia had. But I went to Russia to talk to the Russians about it and to the American Pentagon to try to get some cooperative effort going. Russians were interested, but the United States wasn't interested. Uh, anyway, uh, the, the Russians were going to build a constellation, they called it Prognos, where their satellites would look tangentially at different regions of the Earth. Let me just pull this up here. And you can see they can, uh, they can, they can see certain circular areas of the Earth's surface if they're only looking against the dark background of space. So the Prognos locations are exact. So Prognos 4 was looking at Europe. We know that during the crisis over the Pershings being inserted into Europe, they actually placed a satellite into the Prognos 4 position. They were so worried about Pershing. There were satellites in the Prognos 2 and 3 position were for China, Western and Eastern China. So if we go back, you can see here's Prognos 1, uh, the middle of the United States, ICBM fields, Prognos 4, Europe, Prognos 2 and 3, China. Right now, the, the Russians have given up on this satellite system. They have not been able to get it to work reliably. Not only is this true because we know we know we have records of satellite launches, so we know what satellites are in orbit. But I happen to also know from direct conversations with very high level people in Russia, who I consider friends, and I hope, I think they consider me a friend uh, uh, because they shared this kind of information with me, that Russia just has not been able to solve this problem. So basically they can't see uh, a a short warning, I would call it a short warning attack from the most potent threat they face, the Trident submarine launch ballistic missile. This is a very dangerous situation. So I'll stop here simply because I've taken so much time, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions I can put up. Well, I think that uh, when I heard you speak the other day, uh, you raised uh, some of this concern in the context of the uh, current war in Ukraine. Yes. Um, and uh, could you uh, uh, elaborate a little bit more on that in the context of the Ukraine war? Well, we have no idea how such an exchange could begin. To be, I want to be clear. I have more to say, but just to be clear. It could be from anywhere. For example, uh, we have submarines at sea. And we know, I know for a fact, and we know for a fact, in fact, the Russians know for a fact, that our submarines are trying to engage their submarines. We just had an incident a few weeks ago where a Virginia-class attack submarine was caught by a group of Russian, uh, ex Russian ships exercising near the Sea of Okhotsk, and they chased this submarine out of the area. So they, you know, there are other incidents we know about. So... So there's a, you could have had a collision. Someone could have dropped a real depth charge on the submarine and sunk it. You know, anything could happen. But for the current situation, a guess which could be completely off is that the Russians, is Russian, Russian doctrine is, I should say Russian 
nuclear doctrine, which part of which was worked on, we know was worked on by Vladimir Putin in 2010. So we know he was involved in this. Uh, and this is a matter of open knowledge. Is the Russians were trying to understand how for their situation, nuclear weapons, what, what their nuclear doctrine could, should look like. They're, they are highly aware of their limited, uh, of, of the, their conventional uh, forces uh, being less than capable against Western conventional military forces. We are seeing that in the Ukraine now. Um, it's clear what the Russians were hoping to do was a, uh, a German uh, style blitzkrieg. And uh, like Germany did to France and Belgium in World War II. And they just didn't pull it off, couldn't pull it off. And um, if it were a Western force, I think it would be more likely they could have pulled this off. I don't know they would have because they badly misjudged uh, the, the willingness of Ukraines to fight. And they badly misjudged, misjudged the effectiveness of very modern homing anti-armor uh, weapons, not to mention anti-aircraft weapons. Both of those were bad misjudgments, along with their inability to provide appropriate logistics for a fast moving armored attack. All of that having been said, they have now demonstrated that they do not have an army that's close to up to what Western military, conventional military capabilities are. So um, if, if you take doctrine as a guide to what could lead to uh, an uncontrolled escalation, the doctrine of Russia is that if the leadership reaches a conclusion that the core security and survival of the Russian that state is. Uh, is at risk, escalate to de-escalate. That's the language. In other words, you escalate by using a nuclear weapon or several, small yield. Of course, we would have no idea what the yield of the weapons were. All we would know is a nuclear weapon. And then you stop and you uh, expect the other side to pull up short and not use nuclear weapons in response. Well, it could work, but uh, it's a big bet. I mean, I wouldn't want to bet the future of the world on that kind of doctrine. And again, I remind you, how much did we know, we being the leadership of the U.S., when some planes ran into the uh, in, into the um, World Trade Center. We had no idea what was going on. You think if a couple of nuclear weapons are used in Ukraine or in adjacent countries, we would immediately say, oh, that's what the Russians mean. They're very small. They're, they're trying to just get our attention, blah, blah, blah. Well, uh, it's not realistic. Uh, the level of information that people can, can get in a short timeline and more importantly, collect and get and sort through is near zero for the kind of decision-making that would be required if something like that happened. So anyway, I'll take questions. Helen Caldecott has joined us. Oh. Welcome, Helen. Hi, Helen. You're, a, you're a, a hero to all of us. For your Hel experience. Helen knows me as a war criminal from long back. So I wanted to <laughs> invite Helen if she wants uh, to ask the first question or make a comment. Fine, fine. What fine. about the dead hand? Well, it, you effectively know, I mean, a lot of people have been claiming to know about the dead hand since them. I, I honestly, the more I hear, the less I believe I know, but, but. There is no I know, doubt. The, I know the guy who invented it in Russia. Well, uh, it was who, my friend, but he's dead. What's that? What's the dead uh, Valerie Yarinich? Yes. Yeah, yeah, Valerie. Yeah. yeah. Yarinich. Yeah. Uh, what is it? We, we have a, a, it's a system that people refer to as the dead hands system. That is to say, it guarantees the launch of nuclear forces if the leadership is no longer in a position to make a decision whether or not to launch. And what I would say 
regardless of the details of how it's implemented, we have a dead hand system in Russia. As a, a, you, you may not have been on when I was talking earlier, but uh, the Russians have ha have to pre-delegate launch authority in, in a wide variety of ways. Exactly what they do, I have no idea, but I can tell you, we did similar things in the US, you know, where you say, oh, for example, uh, we used to have, you probably remember this aircraft called Looking Glass, which used to be always flying over our ICBM fields. Yeah. Under certain conditions, under certain conditions, the commander of Looking Glass, which was a one-star Air Force general, could launch all of the ICBMs against Russia. And that condition had to do with loss of communication, belief that we were already under attack, things like that. So there were very closely guarded secrets about what exactly would allow, would release him for this uh, decision, but we did it. And uh, you could do it to submarines at sea. If you chose, you could say, if you lose communication with the United States for you know, X amount of time, and you can't reestablish communication for Y amount of time, uh, you are free to launch your forces, or we can just tell we can send a message out to submarines and say, if, if this communication stops, we're going to continue sending you baseball scores. And if all of a sudden you're not getting baseball scores, you are free to launch. And there is very little doubt that the Russians have already made such arrangements. The exact details are irrelevant. What the relevant point is that the dead hand system is already in place. We have a dead hand system in Russia. This is not a good situation. Okay. Well, uh, it's because um, America wants to win a nuclear war, so they take out Moscow and Putin, and then this automatic rocket leaves the Ural Mountains, yeah, yeah, which well, launches all the weapons, the, right? The, 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 the rocket that you're talking about is only one of numerous measures. It's a rocket... Uh, actually, it's similar to what we have. We have a system called, we used to call it IRCS. <laughs> you have to excuse me. It's so crazy. You understand that. Uh, emergency rocket communication system. It's exactly the kind of thing that we had. We would launch a rocket, you know. And, uh, it may even be a rocket. It, it used to be on a Minuteman, but it may even be a rocket on a uh, on a Trident. I mean, I would, it makes sense to have a rocket on a Trident that would do that. Do you think we're going to make it, Ted? Well, um, if, I, if I could do a physics experiment about uh, whether we would make it through the Cold War alive, I would say, I would have guessed 99 out of 100 times we would have not made it, but we did make it. So I'm not optimistic, but I'm hopeful. You know, th this is not a quantitative, there's no way to quantify the risk. The, the thing we do have on our side, which I believe is, has saved us so far, is that people in political decision-making positions are so afraid of nuclear weapons that when the idea even comes up, they just run away as fast as they can, including presidents. Do you think Putin has lost the plot psychologically? Well, I think he, um, he looks more stressed than I have seen him in the past. My view of Putin, and I, I want to make clear, I'm not talking about the man as a moral human being. I'm, I'm talking about as an intellect. You know, you know, Peter the Great was not such a good guy either. You know, um, but Putin has shown up until now an extraordinary level of uh, of uh, tactical and strategic uh, thinking. He made an extraordinary mistake by going into Ukraine. I mean, I can't begin. I was sure just to show you how, how much I know, I was sure he would not go into Ukraine. The reason was not because I think he's a nice person. I thought he was getting what he wanted. Everybody was upset. Everybody was debating about whether or not NATO and the United States and, and uh, had the right policies. The French and the Germans were talking with the Ukrainians and Russians in the Normandy diplomat di diplomatic discussions. The French and the Germans were already on record being against NATO expansion into Ukraine and, uh, and, and, and Georgia. So 
So I was looking at it and saying, you know, this is hopeful. It's hopeful that enough diplomatic discussion will happen that he won't get immediately, he won't immediately get what he wants. But now people will realize that you can't just play third rate psychologist and dismiss everything this man is saying, because that's what's been going on. Rather than listening to what he has to say and taking him seriously, which I have always done, but our political leadership has not, uh, uh, we, you know, we've gotten ourselves into this situation. Now, I'm not trying to blame everything on the West. You know, he, he made this terrible error, but, but we, uh, we have a lot of blame here to take. Now, he has just said that nuclear weapons, you know, don't rule out the possibility, you know, I put my nuclear weapons on alert. He's already said that. That means all of the submarines have gone out to sea, right? Which incidentally happened a month ago. I was tracking this. The submarines went out to sea. All of the uh, of the uh, land mobile missiles have come gone out from their sheds. That's already happened too. So to be sure that all the tactical nuclear weapons have been moved to locations where they can be utilized if a command goes out. This is not a good situation. And all these people want to do is call his bluff. Well, maybe, maybe he's smart enough to know not to do this. I don't know. You think but, Biden is up to it? Well, I think Biden has shown good judgment uh, prior to this time. He looks like he's looks like Biden is getting a little bit uh, hysterical too. Yeah, I'm afraid Biden has shown good judgment. No fly, no no fly zone, none. Yeah. Right, right decision. Uh, you know, uh, no no NATO countries directly involved. No, you know, no offensive weapons. No, but now he's looking a little erratic now, and and I can. I, I can't tell you what's happening in the White House, but I can speculate based on detailed information from the past. He's got a bunch of 30-year-old guys all who, who are all geniuses. Some of them I've seen and had to deal with. Uh, very unpleasant to talk to. They know everything. You know, I'm ignorant. They don't even know who I am. They're, I'm ignorant. And they, they have no knowledge. Uh, they're only thinking politics. They have no knowledge of the military issues. They have never made a mistake in their life, and uh, and they know what needs to be done. And he's surrounded by these characters. And, you know, after a time, you're exhausted. Some of these guys begin to look like they, they may know what they're talking about. I, I hope he's resisting that, but I just, I don't know. Some I, people say Putin is on cortisone, steroids. Yeah, he, he definitely does well. And that can produce psychosis. Yeah, he, yeah, he always, uh, yeah. Want to get a few other, uh, uh, John Walsh, do you have a question? Um, this is going to be a question that doesn't relate to specifically to Ukraine, because I think your discussion is a more general one and really very informative, at least for me. Um, given all this, um, and, and here I was inspired by uh, what William Perry said at a, at a forum here a couple of years ago. Shouldn't we do as the very first thing, get, get rid of hair trigger alert, launch on warning, and do it the way the Chinese have done by separating their warheads from their missiles, from their delivery systems. It just seems to me that if we if we don't do that, then we have these very short times for decision. And I don't understand actually why the anti-nuclear movement at this point doesn't put that at the top of its list, because we've had a real-time experience with it here now. But maybe there's a reason. Yeah, well, uh, I think you're on exactly the right track. I would be a little ahead of you on this. Uh, I think we should eliminate our land-based missiles, period. If there's no target to shoot at, you're not going to shoot at it. And the submarines are more capable. I want to underscore, if you believe you want to fight and win a nuclear war, which incidentally, I'm not suggesting, <laughs> but if, you, if you're one of these guys who thinks that you can fight and win a nuclear war, the submarines are far more capable as strike weapons, far more. That's why it's so dangerous, because the Russians can't see these broad ocean areas they're, because of the limitations on their satellite technology. But if you want to eliminate, there's no decision to make if there are no land-based ICBMs. The Russians have no decision to make. So I would- but could, 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 could I just follow up on that? 
it seems to me that the, 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 in terms of accidental Armageddon here, the terms of an accidental launch, it seems to me that command and control over the submarines is even more uh, chancy than it is to the land-based missiles. But even if not, do we really want to have uh, put them in the situation where they have to make uh, a fast decision or a decision at all when they're isolated? You only need a fast decision if you believe you have to fight and win a nuclear war because you need a fast decision because you have vulnerable forces and the enemy is going to destroy it. If you, if you, if you, if you can say, look, you use those terrible weapons on my country and my people, I promise you, you and your people are going to die. And I don't have to do it tomorrow, next week. I have the ability to do it because I have survivable nuclear forces that can be brought to bear against you under a wide variety of conditions. So all this talk about the need for speed is generated by an underlying belief that you're going to fight and win a nuclear war. I don't give a damn if we lose every ICBM we have, as long as we didn't have fallout over the country killing millions of people. It doesn't matter to me at all. The Trident is going to do anything you could ever imagine. The problem with the Trident is that they can't see it coming early enough, and uh, and that could cause an accident, which yes. is why, which is why I risked getting arrested in Russia, uh, to go talk to them about the shortfall I discovered. That was a very secret thing to them, and then went to the Pentagon and got laughed at when I talked to the United States about doing something about it. This is where I think Helen and I may have a small disagreement. See, I've never been a fan of de-alerting. And the reason I don't like de-alerting is because the the, the, there's an incentive to try to re-alert in a crisis. And I don't want both sides trying to put warheads back on their missiles. And then, you know, and, and I think just take them away. Just eliminate them. Who needs them? I agree. Yeah. I guess maybe that kind of moves us towards the discussion of what can we do about preventing an escalation of this war, which could lead to a possible nuclear war? Well, the question is, what's practical? I mean, at this point, uh, and I, I don't have an answer to that. There was apparently, uh, Naftali Bennett, uh, you know, the prime minister of Israel, uh, went to sound out Putin. He was in Moscow. Maybe it was last week. Uh, there's an article in the Jerusalem Post, if you guys want a copy of it, that was not repeated anywhere that I could see. So, I have no idea what it means. But he was sounding out Putin to find out what he would require to uh, stop this this terrible thing that's now going on. And uh, quite frankly, from my point of view, it was not totally unreasonable. But I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not one of the geniuses in the American administration or for that matter in Russia. Uh, but the idea was simply that uh, Zelensky uh, agree not to become a member of NATO, not to seek NATO membership, which frankly is a, is a giveaway for nothing because he can't qualify. Uh, NATO requires, because of Article 5, it requires all kinds of things of new members because you don't want to get, you know, you don't want to take on a country that's got all this internal domestic problems. You know, there are all kinds of reasons why. Ukraine, in the foreseeable future, could not be part of this. Now, apparently, he also asked the question, Bennett also asked the question of Putin, and incidentally, there was no clear answer whether how Putin reacted to this. Um, was that um, was that NATO, uh, I'm sorry, that Ukraine limit its uh, military capability, which I think sounds like a no-starter, but uh, I wouldn't do it if I were Ukraine. However, there are things you could do that would, I think, would be palatable, even even to me if I were in Ukraine, because I don't want to be, I don't want to be subject to constant threats from Russia. So, but if you limited my military to uh, extremely capable defensive weapons. All weapons, no weapon is defensive. If you guys are soldiers, you know that. But, you know, these um, these manned portable anti-armor weapons, they are really uh, doing a lot of damage to the Russians. Uh, the drones that can attack columns of armored vehicles are doing a lot of damage. 
uh, man-launched surface-to-air missiles have gotten very good. You know, they, they now can image their targets. So the, the infrared, uh, you know, this is a discussion and the, the technology for these missiles has advanced, you know, it's like a computer game. Anytime you look on your, your, um, your iPhone or your Android phone at images of people and you see the little boxes go up over their faces, shows you what the artificial intelligence is capable of doing in terms of designating and following a target. That's not hard to put given modern technology. It's not hard to put on a man launched missile. And, you know, this is the kind of stuff that allows people, you know, they've, uh, the, some of the statements are they've shot down 30 fixed wing aircraft. That, I don't know if it's true, but it, it's possible. Because if you're going to use fixed wing aircraft to attack ground targets, they're low. Mm -hmm. And if you're low, you're subject to, uh, you know, when I was working with the Navy, all these ground attack pilots I used to know <laughs> is they would, they would have, they would have arguments with the, with the air superiority pilots. They'd say, you know, when I shoot at a target, people are shooting back at me. And, you know, you really can shoot back at people when you have these man launched uh, vehicles, even a fixed wing aircraft. So if you allowed, Ukraine to have that kind of weaponry, which is could be used as part of an offensive capability, but doesn't have to be. Mm -hmm. Then I think then they would be demilitarized in the language of Putin, mm -hmm. at least as far as I can see. I don't know what's possible. The no starter I heard that was in this most recently was that they should not become part of the EU. And I think that's beyond what he should demand of them. Mm -hmm. Finland Finland is part of the EU. It trades very efficiently with Russia and, and with the EU. It is a neutral, non-aligned power. And the Russians have been happy to tolerate it on their border. The problem is that the West has instilled in the Ukrainian vision that they are somehow going to be a bulwark against Russia. That's wrong. That's not the thing to have done. And in effect, in effect, what we are now doing is we are making Ukraine a NATO power by dumping all of these weapons into, into Ukraine. Mm -hmm. They don't have to be part of NATO if they have all the weapons that we want to give them. Right. And, and I think this is the wrong thing because that's the concern that Putin has. And he's not alone in that concern. He may be willing to do much worse than anybody else is willing to do. But